Well, hello everyone and welcome to SEO's May webinar on becoming a competitive applicant. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you all are staying safe and healthy. My name is Avery Cunningham. I am a student services and admissions officer here at SEO. I am one of the admissions team members who answers your admissions questions and participates in the admissions process. Before we get started, I ask that we all use proper Zoom etiquette by keeping microphones muted and less speaking, limiting background noise, and respecting all of this webinar's attendees and facilitators. We will have time for questions towards the end of the webinar, but in the meantime, if you do have any questions or concerns that need immediate attention, please use your chat feature at the bottom of your screen to communicate with us. Today, we'll be discussing the parameters that we look for when describing a competitive applicant for admission. We will open with our Director of Admission, Mike Robertson, giving an in-depth overview of what can make a student shine in the application process. Then two student ambassadors will discuss their application process and share any insights or experiences. This webinar is being recorded and will be free and available to view starting next week on our website. So without further ado, I turn it over to you, Mr. Robertson. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Uh, and welcome those of you who are, are, are listening to us talk about being uh, a competitive applicant. Uh, you see in front of you uh, what we uh, talk about and what we look at when we are uh, considering being a competitive applicant. So we'll cover all of this. As Ms. Cunningham said, we will uh, try to leave it toward the end for questions and answers. You can certainly put them in the chat if you wanted to. Um, but let's get the ball rolling and we'll start uh, talking to you now about uh, becoming competitive. Uh, one thing we always get is, what are, what are you looking for in an applicant? What can I do to make my application better? Um, well, you can always look at numbers. Uh, and then you see the next topic is what is more important, OAT or GPA? And really, both of those are very important. You can have a lower number in one or the other, but you can't have a lower number in each one. And when I say lower, uh, really, the easy way to think about that is numbers that begin with three. So your GPA really needs to be above 3.0, and your OAT really needs to be 300 or above. Uh, have we admitted people with scores below 300 or GPA below 3.0? Uh, Certainly we have. So you just have to uh, try to keep with the, uh, the trends because the average GPA for an entering class hovers around 3.5 to 3.65, and the OAT average is generally around 3.30. So that gives you an idea. Um, but besides the numbers, you really need to be an all-around good applicant. When we say all-around good applicant, we mean that you're involved in activities, that you're, uh, if you're not majorly involved in on-campus activities, maybe civic uh, activities, or maybe you work and you don't have enough time, those two are equal. If you work 20 hours a week or more, you're pretty busy and don't have quite so much time to uh, be involved in uh, civic duties or clubs, organizations, et cetera. So we understand that. Um, but we don't like to see you didn't work and you didn't get involved in activities. So one of the other is going to be very important. The other is going to be the shadowing. And when we say uh, shadowing, we really are talking about a minimum, keyword there, minimum 30 to, to 40 hours. And when I say that, what I mean is if you turned in an application and you had done 35 hours of shadow, or well, you've met our minimum, in my mind, you've got a C in shadowing because that's the, the minimum that we kind of require. So if you do 60, 70, 80 hours, I'm probably going to bump you up to a B or an A. Uh, and again, don't take me literally in that I get a piece of paper and write down your shadowing grade, but it just goes to show you a lot of students really only understand grades. So I like to put it back into a grade for them. If your professor said write a, a two page, five page essay with four references and you did a 10 page essay with eight references, my thought is you did better than uh, what the minimum requirements were. And it's the same thing for us. And it's the same thing for the extracurriculars. Again, uh, 
keeping in mind that extracurriculars mean just that. They do not have to mean only optometric uh, activities or, or clubs that deal with health sciences or, or whatever. You might be involved in theater, drama, music, et cetera, and those all count. We just want you to be uh, fully engaged in life, really is one way to put it. Um, so then you see the question of, should I retake the OAT or the physics class? Uh, I didn't you know, do so well in. And that's really kind of a multi-pronged answer. Uh, the OAT, we're going to give you an idea. So let's say you take the OAT and you make a 300. And I look at your GPA and your GPA is a uh, 3.0. Well, I'm going to tell you to retake the test. I mean, that's just giving you the best advice I can. The physics class, for example, might not be quite the same. Um, we technically only require that you pass the prerequisites. We do not actually have a minimum grade of C. But I think you all know, just like I do, that some classes you take a C in, you learned a lot and you really did maybe master that material. But in other classes you take it in the C or the D is because you didn't understand it and you really did not master that material. In that case, you need to retake that class. Sometimes you make an A or a B in a class. Personally, I can tell you of taking economics one and two in undergrad and uh, making a B and a C, I believe I made. And I couldn't tell you much about economics if you uh, put a gun to my head. So again, you have to kind of use your own judgment know that if you do retake a course, that OptumCast, which is where you submit your big application, is going to treat that repeat just like your undergraduate institution did. So for example, if you took a course, made a D or an F, and you repeat it and make a B, if your undergraduate school listed both of those grades on your transcript, then OptumCAS is going to list both of those grades on your transcript. Some schools will replace a grade. In other words, you make a D or an F and they'll just take that D or F off and put the new grade for the retake. If they do that, then OptumCAS follows that. Uh, so, but I don't think you need to be as worried about the grade as much as you do, how did I master the content? Did I do well in there? Okay, <clears throat> you've got to follow, you don't have to follow this timetable exactly, but it gives you a very good idea. The vast majority of our candidates are applying between their junior and senior year, and they're taking the OAT in the summer between junior and senior year or fall. And that way you've got plenty of time to prepare and plenty of time to retake the test if you need to. OptumCast begins accepting applications around June 30th. Sometimes it will be June 29th or 28th, just depends on the calendar. <clears throat> Excuse me, you don't necessarily have to submit your application on that day, but you also don't wanna wait until December to submit it. Um, so you've gotta find that nice spot. Uh, July, August, September, what I usually encourage and keeping in mind that you've got to send transcripts, letters of reference, write an essay, put in all of your shadowing hours, uh, any experience you have working, uh, extracurriculars, et cetera. Now, as far as those hours, we don't ask that you document that with the help of, a, uh, of the optometrist. We just, we rely upon you to keep up with those hours and then to summarize. So you might have <clears throat> shadowed 25 hours at one office and you're gonna say, I shadowed Dr. Smith. I was able to sit in on patient exams and, and see the following. Some of the diseases I saw were A, B, and C. Just a few sentences to let us know what, what you did. Um, but going back to the transcripts, it is very important that you know that you have to send a transcript from every school 
from which you took a course. And in other words, if you took some courses while you were uh, in the summer in undergrad, or you took courses while you were even in high school, in those courses, the credits were awarded by a community college, you have to send that community college transcript to Optumcast. You cannot say, oh, well, it's, it's on my major transcript. It's on my university transcript. No, that's not how it works. You have to send a transcript from every course in which you attempted, uh, every college from which you attempted a course. The two letters of reference, we require one to be from an optometrist with whom you have worked or shadowed, who is not a relative. And the second must be from your pre-health slash pre-optometry advisor. Or if you don't have that, or let's say you majored in English, then your letter of reference can come from a professor who taught you either a biology, a physics, or a chemistry course. You can submit a maximum of four. After four, you're out of space on the OptumCast application. Now, some people ask me, is it okay if I send four? Well, it's, certainly it's okay. I'm going to be honest and tell you, though, doubling the number of references you send doesn't always uh, make a mark on your file. When I think it's necessary is that when maybe you, uh, you struggle that so then you might want to follow up with uh, an, another academic reference or maybe you've been employed a long time and you want to get a letter in from your employee at Home Depot or wherever you work that's fine uh, it's just once you hit four there's really not any reason to send more than that so once you go to Optum Cash, you're going to fill out their lengthy application but when you First, go in and begin. You're going to be assigned a nine-digit ID number. That ID number is what you're going to use to come to SCO's website and submit our application and $50 processing fee. So our application is very brief. It's mainly just demographics and a few other questions, uh, but it really helps us speed up the processing of your file. So that's why we do that. Um, so you send in your optum pass or you're working on it, and then you send in the supplemental. And we're going to look at uh, when you send the supplemental, we're going to look at the optum cast to see if it's available for us to review. If it is, then we might write you and tell you some feedback. We might look and see that you only shadowed for 15 hours. And so we're going to say, hey, we really need you to shadow some more before we invite you for an interview. Or we may say, Everything looks good, but we're waiting on your OAT results and we can't inter interview a candidate until we have those scores. So we try to give you a heads up. Do not take that anything we send you as a criticism and meaning you're not a good applicant. It's just our way of saying this will make you a better applicant or here's how the process works. Pay attention because timing is very important. One thing you should know about that OptumCast application is they're going to ask you if you want to use their professional transcript entry service. And what that means is they're gonna, they will take your transcripts for you and enter all the coursework into your application. My advice is not to do that. A, is $75. Pay me the $75 and I'll enter it for you. Not really, but you don't want to waste 75. Secondly, they're not going to enter it as fast as you do. You're going to, you're the only grades and courses you have to enter. They have to enter maybe hundreds and they're going to do it on a first come first serve basis. So all you need are copies of your transcript in front of you. And they do make you regurgitate every single course. So for example, you took English comp one, three hours A. Next line, sociology one, three hours, A, next line, so on and so forth. If you make errors, if you skip courses, if you list anything incorrect, when they audit your file, they'll stop it and say, wait, you didn't use the correct 
uh, course abbreviations or you didn't put in all your grades or whatever, that slows your file up. And those are the things you don't really want to do. The early bird always catches the worm. So you want to get it in early because if nothing else, uh, our uh, scholarships and our contract seats that we have with some states go to the best applicants and the best applicants are usually applying early July, August, and September. So sometimes you put yourself at a disadvantage uh, money-wise if you don't apply early. But once again, once we get everything, we look at your Optum CAS application, we then determine if you're gonna be invited uh, for an interview. All of our interviews, or at least the vast majority now, are back on campus. During the pandemic, we went to all uh, virtual interviews. We then went to a hybrid model uh, two years ago, I believe. And then last year, we offered virtual, but only to those who lived hundreds of miles from campus or that it was a uh, a financial burden for them to come for an interview. So be prepared that you're probably gonna have to travel uh, when you uh, get to the point of, of us inviting you. And we give you several dates sometimes to choose from. So you have some flexibility. Our transcripts are, our transcripts. Our interviews are usually on Fridays or Mondays. So you can build it around a weekend, maybe not have to miss uh, too many classes. And that interview is going to be an important part of your or our decision making because we're going to put you in touch with a uh, faculty member who's going to sit in a room with you one on one and ask you questions uh, to see if they believe you have the communication skills to uh, become a at least a health profession student and hopefully a doctor. And our our interviews, not the interview itself, but the interview day lasts about six or seven hours because we feed you lunch, we give you a tour of the campus, we give you a tour of uh, the city of Memphis, we give you a chance to talk with students, etc. So it does take the uh, large portion of a day. And you know, if you get an interview, your chances of being admitted have gone up dramatically. But uh, an interview can also break a candidate. And sometimes a paper, uh, a candidate looks really good on paper, and then they come in for an interview and it's not so successful and uh, they're not admitted. So that's, like I said, that's just a, 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 a review of how the process works. Um, and certainly you can ask questions about that later. So for the class that entered last year, uh, normally, we try to enter between 130 and 140 students, and we had 133 out of 806. Now, the first thing I want you to know is that does not mean we only offered seats to 133 candidates. Because there are 23 schools and colleges of optometry, we may offer a seat to a candidate and they decide to go elsewhere, or they decide to go into another health profession. So really, we end up interviewing between 250 and 300 candidates. So we might offer seats to somewhere between 250 and 300. But again, we know that those, uh, some of those candidates are gonna withdraw and attend someplace else. Um, technically, you do not have to have a bachelor's degree, but you see when 132, of your 133 had a bachelor's degree or higher, that it is pretty incumbent upon you to finish your undergraduate degree. Um, you've, you've got a stellar record, we can talk on the side, or you can email me or call me, uh, that there is a chance you could get in after completing just your junior year. But again, only one candidate last year got in that way. Uh, the average GPA, 3.69 and an average OAT of 3.35. Again, very important to know that you do not have to have those numbers. An average is made up of lower numbers and larger numbers. I would say that the range this past year was about a 2.7 or a 2.75 to a 400. We had 400s on the OAT. Now you're going, well, gosh, a 2.75, 
How did he or she get in? Well, they had a 340, a 350, or a 360 on the OAT. And often what happens is a candidate starts off poorly in undergrad, and then he or she writes the ship as time goes on. But once you start off with a low GPA, even making a full point multiple semesters after that, it takes it a while for a GPA to increase. So sometimes that's what we get are candidates who started poorly, but then uh, finished better, or they really finished with a, a poor record, but went back to school and took new courses, repeated courses, made all A's and B's, uh, and then they took the OAT and performed well. So again, it's, it's, it's not so much the average, it's more of the range that you need to pay attention to, although the averages give you an idea of when you become competitive for scholarships. So here we are talking again about applying early. Again, a year in advance of enrollment. So you're gonna graduate, let's say in May of 23, then you should be applying in July of, of 22. Uh, so you have to, again, you can take longer, but it just makes the process a little tougher for you. So do your shadowing, uh, do your test prep, uh, and then take the OAT, contact your references, begin the applications, finish the applications, and then uh, hopefully get an interview invitation. One thing that's very important to remember is sometimes the admissions process becomes more of a marathon than a sprint. In other words, there will be candidates who apply in July or admitted in August and everything's finished for them at that point. Then there'll be candidates who apply in July, August, and September who may not get interviewed until January or February. Uh, it depends on your file. And generally those who get interviewed much later, it's because their GPA was lower and we wanted to wait on their fall grades or They've uh, not done enough shadowing, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you, you, if you submit an application to us and it's anything less than 15 hours of, of, of shadowing, we're probably going to not interview you until you document some more. So uh, even though you apply early, sometimes it does get stretched out into a longer process. Okay, there are those numbers again. They won't go away, will they? Um, we usually say retake that OAT if you score 310 or below. Um, sometimes that's not necessary. You're a 3.9 GPA and you make a 310. I may not ask you or recommend that you retake. Uh, but let's say you're, again, a 3.25 and you make a 300 you know, you're pushing it on the competitive level. You might get in, you might not. So uh, again, you need to allow yourself plenty of time to retake that test. And currently you have to wait 60 days in between uh, test administrations. As far as the courses, that's what I was referring to earlier. You've got to pass the class, but did you learn the material? Uh, if you've already taken the OAT, let's say it was a physics class. No, I don't want to use physics. That's a, a bad example. Let's say it's organic chemistry. You took organic chemistry and you made a B, but you made a, a 230 in that section. Well, something tells me either something happened on the test or you didn't really learn the material in the class. OAT offers a test that you can take, practice test. Now, there are other software and other places that offer practice tests. I recommend the ones offered through the OAT because they are the people who, who write the test. Um, you're not going to get the same questions on your test when you take it, but it gives you an idea of the complexity and the abundance of material that you need to prepare for. So a lot of candidates ask, you know, what should I do to prepare for the test? I can't really answer. I can give you resources 
for example, there's an OAT destroyer, there's an OAT boot camp, there's Kaplan's OAT guides, and then there's Chad's videos that are available online. You may do better with one or the other. You know, that's hard to say. Um, and I can't also cannot tell you how much you should study because every person's different. I will tell you this, it's not a very sound decision in my opinion to take the test to just quote, see how I will do because the test now cost $515, I believe. Again, give me that $515. Don't spend money that you're going to waste. And then some candidates will go, well, I'll just take that test just to see how it is. And then I won't report that score. Well, you're making a mistake there because you take the test the second time and you say, send my scores to Southern College of Optometry. Guess what? They don't send just one score. They send all scores. So we're going to see whatever you made on every attempt that you have. Um, and then, and on, the, on the flip side of that, don't, you know, let's say you make a bad score and you think we're going to say you're rejected right away. No, we're going to write you and say, hey, you need to retake. And if you say, sure, I'm going to retake, then we just put a note down that you're retaking. We wait on new scores. So uh, the, the test is very important, but the, the score, the amount of prep, all those things are individualized. You have to determine what's, what's best uh, for you. And like I said, that's what we're here for in the admissions office uh, is to give you the feedback you need as you go through these processes. This is the one that I think um, a lot of people misunderstand. One is when we say 30 to 45 hours of shadowing, we will include work experience as that. But the next bullet you see says at least three different modes of practice. And what we mean by that is you need to go to at least one private practice. And a private practice is generally one, two, or three optometrists in an office, and they run that office themselves. You might want to go to an office where the optometrist is working with an ophthalmologist. That's a second type of office. You may want to go to a commercial practice like a lens crafters or a pearl uh, because they're going to be different than the other two. You, if you can get in a VA hospital's optometry clinic, go for it. They supposedly have disallowed shadowing. Uh, maybe you have a connection somewhere. Or if you go to a hospital, there are hospitals that, uh, besides VA that have optometry clinics. So let's just say you, you submit an application to me and you say, I have 550 hours. And you're going, well, I blew that out of the water, didn't I? But you all have all 550 hours at one office. I'm going to write you and say, I need you to go to at least one other office and spend four hours, six hours, whatever. Because what happens is you go to an office and you get it in your head that that's how all optometry offices work. So Dr. Jones does his procedures like this. That's the way those procedures are done. And in reality, that may just be the way Dr. Jones does it. Uh, he may take shortcuts. I'm not criticizing Dr. Jones for that, but you need to see that different offices have different ways that they perform procedures, different staff, uh, staffing models, et cetera, so that you understand. What, what, one more way to make that clear is there are optometrists who work every day and never prescribe glasses. There are other optometrists who work every day, and that's all they do is prescribe glasses. And that should give you a good idea of what I'm talking about. One uh, optometrist might be treating diseases much more than he or she is uh, prescribing glasses. So see how the other side lives is the way I put it. Or maybe you can just go to two private practices, one that's a single uh, doc owner and the other one might be uh, three or four doctors. Uh, you just wanna see how those different offices uh, operate. Uh, 
when we say uh, you need to know the political side of your profession, uh, the reason we say that is because whether you realize it or not, optometry is the only health profession that a legislature dictates your mode of practice, really, or your your scope of practice. So, for in other words, in some states you can perform laser procedures uh, as an optometrist. In other states you cannot, and that's all decided by a legislature. So sometimes students go, "Oh, I hate politics. I'm not getting involved in politics." Well, you're going you're going to be at the uh, short end of the stick because you're going to probably have to be involved in politics. Uh, if you want to advance your profession and what you're allowed to do. It's, it's important to look at that. Another area might be, and this is an older area, but for example, you, in this case, you had to put politics aside. Uh, when the America Affordable Care Act came out, otherwise known as Obamacare, you know, a lot of people said, oh, I'm not doing that, Obama, that's those Democrats. Well, optometrists gained a lot from Obamacare. They were able to do things they had not been able to do before. Uh, so it advanced the profession of optometry. So you've got to pay attention to what's going on in your state, especially the states that you think you will uh, work in. And then understanding how healthcare works in general. Uh, you know, you've been a patient, but you're going to about to be a doctor and things are different sometimes for the doctor. And you need to pay attention when the news is talking about changes that have come through from uh, one various government department or another, uh, because that's going to affect you in the long run. So if you can get to a state optometric association meeting, go. A lot of times they allow guests to come. And you can listen and hear. Sometimes they allow guests to attend their lectures. So you might go to lectures that are dealing with uh, what the direction of the state is as far as professions. You just want to be aware. We're not going to ask you to recite every state law regarding optometry. What we're going to do is see if you understand that it is run by a legislature and see if you have an idea of what the field of optometry is really all about. Okay, there's that extracurricular service and employment information I was talking about. Um, my philosophy is you're not going to get anywhere in the world unless you are, are participating in the world. And that means uh, that you're doing different things. You're, you're, you're a student, you're a citizen, you're a sister, a brother, a son, a daughter, possibly a, a parent. Um, and we like to see that you can juggle. So let's say you're none of those. You're the only child and you go to undergrad. Uh, then we're really gonna look to see, well, did you get involved in some of those volunteer organizations? Did you uh, join clubs? Were you a leader in those clubs? One thing you're going to find is that, especially if you go into private practice, your private practice's success is often dependent upon uh, your, uh, how well people know you in your community. So that means if you're from a smaller town, even a, a big city, you're gonna probably have to be involved in Lions Club, Rotary Club, uh, whatever club you can. You're going to be donating to the local high school football team or taking an ad out in their program because you want everybody to see your name and know, hey, look, she's really participating in this community. I think I'll go to her for my doctor. Uh, it, it's, it's a win-win situation. You're, you're helping your community, you're helping this world, and then you're helping your own practice. So that's why it's very important. And the other thing to remember is that when you get to professional school and you're taking 22, 23 hours a semester, that's a lot of pressure. If you've just skated through undergrad, you're not preparing yourself as much. So one thing I encourage is employment. And I encourage employment in 
uh, customer service related professions. And that often means, at, say you're in retail, you work at a restaurant, you work at a bar, um, work in the holidays at a department store, find out what it's like to deal with the public. Because as much as you might say, you, I'm not gonna stand for <clears throat> someone being rude to me. <clears throat> Excuse me, when you get to your own practice, uh, you can't throw people out of your office every day. Nobody's gonna come. So you have to start learning you know, what are the ways to handle uh, a difficult patient? What are the ways to handle a rude patient? And by dealing, if you, I, I guarantee if you go to work for a restaurant uh, and are a waiter or a hostess, you're going to deal with some ugly people. Uh, and that's your, your training ground. So uh, the other thing that's at the bottom of this uh, diagram, you see it says commitment to the field. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes we get students who uh, thought they were going to be another healthcare pro professional and they decided against it. And I had a young lady a couple of years ago who actually went to dental school and she had shadowed hundreds of hours, maybe thousands, uh, counting employment, had gone to dental school and then she didn't like dentistry, which I totally understand. And she, uh, decided, well, let me, you know, I'll be an optometrist. And I think she had shadowed two hours. And, you know, my reaction to her was, let me make sure I'm following you. You have thousands of hours of dental experience that told you you do not want to be a dentist, but you have two hours of optometry experience and you know you want to be an optometrist. Uh, that's just a slap in the face, really, is what that is. So you have to commit Commitment to the field of optometry means you're committed to the general health care of a patient and certainly the vision of that patient. And that needs to come through in your application. Okay, these things, we professional tips, we never used to do these and we found out we need to. Uh, the first one you see is using appropriate etiquette in all forms of communication. These young ladies who are going to talk to you in a minute, who are very smart young ladies, students here, will tell you, I'm pretty easy to get along with, and but I'm not your best friend when you first apply. So when you apply, or you, let's say you just contact me and you go, hey, Mike, well, you know, I'm 60 years old. Maybe you should call me Mr. Robertson to start with. Uh, and I don't mean that just because of me. I mean that with anybody you're corresponding with. We've had candidates come for interviews and the faculty member would say, uh, hi, John, I'm Dr. Bill Smith. And the student would turn to them and go, well, hey, Bill, it's nice to meet you. That's not a great way to start off a conversation with a faculty member. So it's really just about a little bit of respect. Once I get to know you, I'm going to encourage you to call me Mike because I feel old when people call me Mr. Robertson. Some people can't do it, they just can't let go. And I understand that. Uh, but know ahead of time that you should use more formal language probably. Um, the other thing is when you, you've got a question, there's this thing called the internet that often has your answers. I don't mean some deep complex question or I don't mean telling you which physics course we prefer. But sometimes candidates will ask a question that is just so simple that they would just pop up our website and look. Um, you don't do yourself any favors by asking basic questions that you could have found online. Sometimes people will call us and say, what courses do I need to take? You know, I really don't feel comfortable in regurgitating the 10, 12 courses you have to take. So look those up and then maybe contact and say, I'm not really sure about physics or whatever. Uh, the other thing is allowing a, a reasonable time for admissions. I'm going to dare say that Southern College of Optometry, that we had the best admissions uh, office in the country, at least as far as optometry schools. And I'm going to guarantee you just about the vast majority of our emails, we're gonna to respond to you same day, if not same hour. 
you know, it, it's that's just the way we are. But you really have to allow people at least 24 hours or more, in my opinion, to respond. So don't send an email at 915 and at 10 o'clock you're calling me because I haven't responded to your email. Again, that's just not really respectful of my time and, and the work that I have to do. Again, don't take it as just me. This is everybody, professionals that I work with. And then when we say ask lots of questions, uh, I'm going to tell you again a, a pet peeve. My boss says there's no such thing as a dumb question, and I disagree with him. There are lots of dumb questions. A dumb question to me is when you could easily find the answer elsewhere. But let's just say that you're meeting with your advisor the next day, and you've got a choice between algebra-based physics or calculus-based physics, and you're not sure which one. Or you can't get in the biochem course, and we accept molecular biology, but you're not sure about that molecular biology course. Call us. That's what we're here for. You know, a lot of people go, I don't mean to bug you. No, you're not bugging me if you're asking pertinent questions. So be ready to ask questions. I can tell you one case in particular of a student one time who literally lost $100,000 in free money because he didn't ask the questions that he needed to ask. He missed a deadline and his home state said, sorry, we're not taking anything after a deadline. So you, you just ask those questions in which you truly need an answer that don't come available through other resources rather easily. All right, so at this time, we're going to open up the pre-assigned questions that we have for our two student ambassadors. Um, we will, to our attendees, we will definitely have a chance for questions for everyone after this. So if there are any questions that you see addressed here that um, don't align with what your concerns are, you feel free to ask those questions in a few minutes, but we're going to go ahead and get started then. Um, so then Charlotte, Jabir, would you both mind introducing yourselves real quickly before we get started? Sure, yeah, I can get started. Um, my name is Charlotte Logan. I'm a current student, uh, student ambassador at Southern College of Optometry. Um, I'm currently in the summer between my first and second year, and I am from Sherwood Park, Alberta, Canada. Hi, everyone. I'm Jabria Powell. I am also a first year ambassador, um, similar to Charlotte, we're in between our first and second year. I'm from Byron, Mississippi, and I'm excited to be here with you all today. Thank you both. Okay, so getting started, um, and either of you can start with this question. When did you begin preparing for your optometry school application? I guess I can start with this one. Um, so for um, the entire application, considering all the different steps, I actually took my OAT the summer of the year before I applied. So a little bit different from that timeline that Mr. Robertson was showing you folks. Um, so I took it in 2020, which would be the summer between my sophomore and junior year. And then I actually started my application um, in August and kind of worked on it throughout September of 2021, which was early in my senior year. Um, and then I finalized it in late September. Um, one thing I will say about the application as well, I do have to agree with uh, Mr. Robertson about the professional transcript review. Um, I paid for it and I regret it because I still had to fix some mistakes that they made um, when they input my transcript information. So I would, if I were you guys, I would just do it, you know, yourselves um, and be meticulous with it. And then there won't be any delays in your application as well. So I just wanted to add that tidbit of my own experience too. So similar to Charlotte, um, so let me start by first saying that I did enter optometry school the year after I graduated from undergrad. So some people, a lot of people do take gap years, but I didn't. So I began pre um, pre preparing the summer before um, optometry school. And I would even go to say that I started preparing at the end of my junior year, just kind of mentioning to some of my professors or the people that I wanted to write my letters of recommendation, like, hey, you know, I want to go to optometry school. I was wondering if you would um, be able to write a favorable <laughs> letter of recommendation on my behalf during that junior year and then into the summer kind of reminding people um, because oftentimes 
adults and just like um, we get busy and sometimes they forget. So you want to kind of mention it to them way ahead of time so they can start working on it. And um, also, I wanted to be sure that my letter recommendation was not just one that they kept, you know, on stash for all the letters or recommendations they have to write. I wanted one that was unique and personal to me. So um, starting that process early, just kind of putting it in their head and then reminding them of those due dates on when you want to have your um, application submitted by. So I began um, probably late my junior year, and then I think I ended up submitting my application around September. Also, just to add to that, the application process can be very long. The Optom cast, it asks a lot of questions about different experiences. And then if you are going to input your transcript, which I did myself, that takes a while. So you want to go ahead and get started, even if you're, you're not going to finish it the next day, but just go ahead and start opening it and um, looking at those different requirements that you have to input. That way you have time to kind of work on it over um, a period of time. Great, thank you. And we've heard Mr. Robertson talk some about shadowing experience. Um, for your individual um, journeys, what was your shadowing experience like? How did you look for it? Um, and how many hours approximately, if you remember, did you gain? Okay, I'll start on this one. How did I gain shadowing experiences? So I first started when I was interested in optometry. I just kind of mentioned it to everyone. I was like, I think I'm interested in optometry. And I would have professors that would have friends that were optometrists, or even some of my friends knew optometrists. And from there, I just um, was able to get connected with different optometrists in my area. And they were more than happy to have me to come by. Except when COVID happened, then that brought its own issues. But I was able to get some shadowing experience before COVID. And then some after, well, I guess COVID's over now. Um, I got some later on in the pandemic. Um, so that's kind of what happened. Just kind of mention it to people and you never know what might come from that conversation and say, oh, hey, uh, I want to tell you about my optometry and maybe you can shadow them. And so through that, I was able to get off um, some different modalities of optometry as well to shadow different um modalities of optometry so that was interesting um and also I was able to even work at an optometrist office and I know Charlotte had a lot of experience working at one as well but I was able to get a little experience teching um and so that's always good just to get those patient interactions like Mr. Robertson mentioned earlier um you really you're gonna get different people you're never gonna have a day where you're just going to have all good patients or all bad patients. So you need to be able to understand that how patients come in and how you meet them where they are. Um, so I think that was really important too. Yeah, I think my experience was similar to Jabria. Like she mentioned, I also had a lot of work experience at a clinic. So I actually started working at an optometry clinic in my hometown um, before I even knew I wanted to do optometry. I was kind of doing my undergrad. I was um, in my, I guess it would have been my, oh my gosh, I think it was my freshman year actually. And so I just started university. I didn't know what I wanted to um, do yet in terms of healthcare. There's lots of different um, subtypes of professions within healthcare. And my mom just suggested, hey, why don't you ask, um, you know, my optometrist, Dr. Atwell is his name, um, if he's hiring. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to do optometry. And, you know, I heed and hawed about it. And I ended up just applying because I thought, hey, if, if worst case scenario, you know, you get involved, you see what it's like. Um, and so I did get a job there working kind of reception, doing some um, technician work as well, um, working a little bit in the optical. So doing a little bit of everything. Um, and so I worked there for um, basically three, three and a half years before I uh, before I actually went to optometry school. So I have hundreds of hours um, of quote unquote shadowing experience there. And I was lucky because, you know, sometimes if you work at a clinic, you don't get a ton of shadowing experience, but the doctors that I worked for were so wonderful about showing me, you know, great clinical cases. Or if somebody had, you know, if there was a patient that came in and they were comfortable with a student, you know, watching the exam or something like that, then um, I was always given that opportunity. So I was very lucky in that sense as well. And even from there, once I started working at that clinic, um, optometry is a very small world and you'll get to know that the more you get involved in it, but 
basically a lot of optometrists know each other from, you know, they go way back from school or just from their community. So I, you know, they had a lot of connections, the doctors there that I worked for. And so they, they were able to set me up um, in order to shadow at some other clinics, just so that I had an idea of what optometry was like at other places. Because like I said, I worked at the clinic that I, um, that my optometrist worked at. So I'd only ever been to see him at that clinic in that setting. And just, you know, really reiterating what Mr. Robertson said, it's good to get some experience at different clinics, just to take a look at what other optometrists do, what it looks like, because everybody runs their practice a little bit different. Um, and so that was really great for me to do that. So like I said, I had hundreds of hours of, you know, shadowing and working um, in a clinic. And that really, I think, bolstered my application and my knowledge of the profession um, so that when I interviewed and applied, um, I had so much knowledge that was just, you know, automatic for me. I it was built in and I didn't have to think about what I was going to say to answer questions because I had that passion already. So um, I'd say that was kind of my overall shadowing experience. Thank you. And then um, real quickly, um, you, and you touched on this a little bit, but how early exactly in the cycle did you apply? Maybe for those who are trying to figure out what the best time might be for them to get their application in if they can't get it in on the opening day, June 30th. I think I was around that September mark where I actually applied. Um, and I think they say that those first, just like Mr. Robertson mentioned earlier, I think that those first few months, if you can get it in by September, early October, um, that would be good. So I would, I think I applied in September. Yeah, I was similar. Like I mentioned, I started my application in August just to open it up, see what I really had to fill out, what I had to do. Um, and then I had it finalized by the end of September of, um, I guess, my senior year of um, college. So then it was, you know, done. And then I was ready to enter optometry school the following year. Thank you. Um, and then how did you both approach the short essay slash personal statement? How long did it take you to complete it? And do you have any recommendations for those who might not be comfortable with personal statement type essay questions? I can start with this one. So um, this one, I would say, you know, it is probably one of the most important essays that you'll write during your application. So I wrote it kind of over multiple days, rereading and editing it probably around a total of eight to 10 hours on it, you know, cumulatively. So, um, you know, I talked, I think there's a, a pretty good prompt that comes with that short essay or personal statement about, and, you know, I just talked about how I decided and kind of found optometry, um, why I thought it would be a good fit for me, especially over other careers, showing that you've thought a lot about what you want to do um, and why you think optometry is such a good fit for you. Um, also, just what you know about the profession, which is where shadowing comes in really, really nicely. Um, how you're preparing for optometry with different classes and shadowing and, um, and things like that. Also kind of what I wanted in the future, what I, what I pictured my life looking like as an optometrist, what I wanted to be involved in, um, scope of practice and, you know, the, the legalities of the profession um, is something I'm quite passionate about. Um, and then just reflecting on your experiences um, and your, your passions, your goals, um, and going beyond just helping others. You know, I think that you know, we all want to help others, especially if you're getting into any healthcare profession. So, you know, your the, the interviewers know that and the admissions committee knows that you want to help others, right? So you can mention that, but I'd say try and go beyond that. Um, you don't have to get really super personal or deep into your private life by any means. Um, you're just explaining why you're excited about optometry, right? Um, shadowing gives you lots to talk about and any life experience gives you lots to talk about. So not just school, but any traveling you've done, specific volunteering, leadership um, positions that you've had, anything like that that you can um, use if you're not super comfortable with personal statements. Um, just talking about any life experience that you have um, is, I think, um, quite quite helpful. And the biggest thing is just don't don't lie. And that's probably a little bit obvious, but I think that people can sometimes, you know, want to fib or you know stretch the truth a little bit to make themselves seem like a really great applicant, but don't do it. You'll regret it. And when you get to your interview, you'll be worrying about, oh, what did I write for that? And what did I write for this? And what did I put down for that specific task that I had or job that I had? So if you don't lie and you're you're just very honest about what why you're here, what you want, then you never have to look over your shoulder and remember what you wrote for this specific job or, oh, did I actually do that or did I not? Right. So 
Um, that would be my kind of tip for that. I think Charlotte, you hit like a lot of, took a lot of the words out of my mouth um, for a lot of the tips and pointers. But unlike Charlotte, I think you said it took you maybe a few weeks or so, but it may have taken me actually a few months to write my personal statement only because I do have trouble writing and that was not my strong suit. So I started out, you know, I was like, where do I start? Like, how do I express to the admissions committee that I'm interested in optometry? I just had trouble I knew I wanted to be an optometrist and I knew I wanted to go to optometry school, but I kind of had trouble conveying that in words on a piece of paper. So I, you know, talked with my aunt and she said, just start writing, just put words on a paper. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to be cohesive right now. Just start writing. And so that's what I did. And then after I wrote, then, you know, you think about other things and you kind of sit with things. It may not make sense today. So then you think about things tomorrow or the next day, you kind of revisit it. So I, if you're not someone who enjoys writing or that may not be your strong suit, then I just say just start. Even if you just start typing something in your notes on your phone, just start writing. And then after that, I had others to read it, like English professors or my friends or optometrists um, to check it grammatically. And also just to make sure it sounded like who I was, like is what I wrote on this paper, is that also the person that you all see every day? And so that's kind of where I started. And then actually... I kind of scratched it um, because after I got comment, uh, feedback from it, they said, well, this is who you are, but it's kind of boring. Like it doesn't really show who you are. And so I was like, okay. So then I kind of added a unique twist to my personal statement, um, tried to make it stand out. And I think that's what's really important. The admissions committee, as you see, they read probably 250 to 300, maybe even more. Um, personal statement so what's going to make yours stand out what's going to make them want to read yours to the skin or what's going to make them not be able to predict the next word that you're going to say everyone says that which I didn't know but everyone says oh when I first got glasses I could now see the leaves on the trees well I didn't know that that was like a common thing but they've heard that millions of times so don't let yours start off that way um so it took me maybe a month or two to well probably two or three months to finalized my personal statement but once I finished it I was really happy with what I um, wrote and then recommendations um you know I would really recommend that you really get your families and friends and other optometrists to read it um to and people are more than happy to read it I think it's what maybe two pages or so so um people are more than happy to read it for you and give you their feedback as well so those would be my recommendations Great, thank you. Um, and then for you both, what was your interview experience like, the actual interview day, if you interviewed in person or your virtual interviews, if you interviewed virtually? And how did you prepare? All right, so for me, I would say um, each school is definitely different in terms of how they run their interview days and even the, the actual official interview itself, how that's structured. Um, I know that um, at SCO, it's, um, you know, you kind of have like a one-on-one -on -one with um, somebody from the admissions committee to talk about your file and, and things like that. And they might, you know, ask you some questions there and then have a, you know, the one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member to do the formal interview. Um, but every school is different and you might not completely know, um, well, you won't know, right, exactly what they're going to ask you. You can prepare um, as much as, as much as you want. I know for myself, um, I Kind of focused on you know they always ask all oh, your weaknesses and stuff right so i focused you know on, on knowing my weaknesses and being ready to explain them um, not making excuses but just how i'm working on them um, i looked at some generic interview um, prep questions online um, and then i also just practiced talking in front of a mirror answering those questions that made me feel really good about um you know how i was talking and and how i was wording things properly so that i was um, coming across as an effective communicator and um, so that was really helpful for me, especially because I did interview virtually. It was COVID times and just being from Canada, it's such a long journey. So um, I did interview virtually and it was certainly shorter than that um, six to seven interview uh, hour interview day that Mr. Robertson was talking about. But um, so it was only, you know, about an hour and a half, two hours. Um, but it uh, it was it was a great experience. I felt like it was very conversational, at least at SEO. And um, I think that 
like I said, if you have done a lot of um, research into the profession, looking at, you know, shadowing optometrists and working, you're going to have so much to talk about that the conversation will flow very freely and you won't have to worry about thinking about, you know, well, what if they ask me this? And well, do I have a perfectly formulated answer for that question and things like that? So if you have a lot of experience and, and a lot of passion for the profession, that will certainly show through in the interview. Um, so even though you can, you know, look at generic um, interview prep questions online. You can read books. There's tons of, you know, medical school interview books or optometry school interview. Those kinds of books are, are good if you want to, you know, do that. Um, you can make notes on the specific school or city. So you have talking points. I know I did that. I also made some notes and kind of reviewed my, my short essay and personal statement, just so I had some, um, some talking points about myself and even some extra info that I couldn't quite fit in there, but I thought it might be nice for the interviewer to know. Um, and so having all that kind of prepped, I didn't spend, you know, hours and hours preparing for interviews and doing practice interviews, like mock interviews with a friend or anything like that. Um, I have a fair amount of interview experience um, just through job, um, applying for different jobs and in um, volunteer roles and things like that. So I had myself personally a fair bit of interview experience. And so I wasn't, I wasn't too stressed about it. Honestly, I tried to just relax, you know, get lots of sleep before, make sure I had a nice um, formal outfit picked out. Um, even though it was virtual, I just wanted to look nice um, and just, you know, be ready to be very positive, be very kind to everybody. Um, and, you know, make sure that I, I know a lot about the school's mission and special offerings in their clinic and, and myself and my goals before going into the interview. And if you know that stuff, then um, you're going to you're going to do great. Um, now that a lot of interviews are back on campus, I would say that be sure you're nice to everyone that you meet on campus. Um, that is a huge thing. I know, especially at SEO, um, you know, we we're, we really value that a lot of that that kindness and respect. And so um, you know, just treating everybody nicely because you never know, right? Who, who, who is who, right? Even when you walk in to a school. So um, be kind to those people, have some good, thoughtful questions, like Mr. Robertson was saying, not just some obvious ones about, about the school and whatnot, but some really thoughtful questions about the school's programs or the clinical education or some things that, you know, you really want to know. Um, and, and having those prepared will also make you um, stand out as an applicant as well. Um, Charlotte, of course, you always hit the nail on the head, but um, just to add to that, since my interview was actually in person, um, SEO is really nice. SEO has really nice facilities, and the people at SEO are really kind. So um, as far as my interview experience, it was great. Um, everyone, from the time you walk in to the time you leave, you really feel at home. Um, just to add to my actual interview experience with the professor, I remember, like Charlotte said, it was just very conversational. Um, they actually, I think they had to come get us because we were talking too much. And so um, just be authentically you, like Charlotte mentioned earlier, don't lie about anything. If you don't lie about anything and everything that you put on your personal statement or within your application, then it's really nothing to have to make up. It's authentically who you are and you never know what you might have in common with the interviewer so for example um I did some research and took classes in public health and my professor who interviewed me he actually had a master's in public health so imagine if I would have lied about those experiences that I had it would be it would um, have been kind of a tough conversation to have with him but because we were able to have kind of these authentic authentic conversations um, I think I had a really good interview. So be nice, be kind, and be um, be you. How did I prepare? Um, similar to Charlotte, um, before my optometry school interviews, I really took some time to kind of think about who I was as a person. Sometimes we go through life and we just kind of go through the motion, but do you ever sit back and reflect on who am I and what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses truly? And what are three words to describe me? These may not be questions that the interviewer acts, but these are things that you should just know about yourself. That way you're more confident going in speaking about yourself because this is an opportunity where you get to sell yourself to others. So I think kind of taking some time to reflect before you go into interview um, is also a good thing. But Charlotte, you did a great job hitting most of the key points. So I don't want to um, belabor the point. 
Thank you. And then our last question, any last bits of overall advice you'd give to students who are looking for ways to make their application stand out? Yeah, so kind of how we mentioned earlier that personal statement, a lot of us are going to get degrees in microsciences, so you're not really different from many other applicants, or you're probably going to have some shadow and experience, so that doesn't really make you too different from other applicants, but really what you write in your personal statement will truly make you stand out um, compared to other applicants, and also those unique experiences that you have, whatever that may be, whether you did research or whether you graduated college in two years, Anything that may be unique about you, even if you don't really think it's unique, be sure to talk about that and really bring that to the forefront for the um, admissions committee to know you are unique and they don't want, you know, what I do like about SEO and I can't really compare to other schools since I don't go there, but I feel like each student at SEO is not just someone who is so smart and, you know, don't do anything else outside of studying. We are all individuals and we have lives outside of that. And that that's what really, I think, is going to make us good doctors and also just good students. So you have to be able to balance both of them. So show them um, in your application and as well as during your interview that you're more than just uh, someone who just sits up and studies all day. You want to be someone who has a life outside of school and can have conversations with um, others. So I think that's something that I would recommend. Yeah, Jabria said it perfectly as per usual. Um, you know, a lot of people that are applying have um, similar experiences, right? We are interested in the sciences in healthcare. We want to help people. We want to do all those things. So um, I think it's important to think about your background as well. Like I know myself, I come from a fairly rural area. Um, and I think that really shapes who I am, how I view the healthcare system, how I view, um, you know, a lot of my own experiences. And I think that thinking about yourself not comparing yourself to others in a competitive sense, but comparing yourself to other people in the US and in North America in general and how your experiences have been maybe different from them. Um, I think that is really helpful because, you know, I might not be, I had a, probably a very different upbringing and, and, and a different, um, different life experiences from somebody, you know, like Jabria from Mississippi or something like that, right? So um, some of those personal anecdotes, I think, are um, really important, as well as any, like, leadership roles that you have, even if it's not, you know, volunteering or saving the world or inventing some great thing, you know, sometimes those small roles that you have in, you know, maybe you're really involved in a certain sports team or, um, you know, you played, you know, sports in college or you have a job where, you know, you worked at Starbucks, but you worked as a, you know, a shift supervisor, something like that, where you have some leadership um, and some other skills that you've developed through things that are not necessarily optometry related. Um, I think it's really important. Like Jabria said, you know, at SEO, we really value a well-rounded, um, you know, student coming in. And so if you have a lot of different experiences in your life um, that bolster you as a person and how you balance your love for, um, you know, healthcare and science and optometry with, you know, your personal life and your hobbies, um, that can show through volunteering your work or um, if you have like a unique major or minor or something like that, then um, I think that will really set you apart. But um, again, like Jabria said, just being, you know, authentic and, and that that's kind of the key thing that that will really help to make you stand out. All right, thank you both so much for addressing these questions. Um, now we're going to open it up to questions from our attendees for all of our guest facilitators, Charlotte, Mr. Robertson, and Jabria. Um, as I said, you can use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll be sure to address your questions. Um, we'll wait for those to come in. And then while waiting on those questions, um, Mr. Robertson, do you have anything to add based off of what you heard from our two students just now? No, but I, I will say it's just like I told you all beforehand. Uh, these two young ladies are, are pretty phenomenal, and I'm afraid they're coming from my job the way they answered these questions so well. Uh, I will throw in one more thing about the essay, and that's just that... Um, an essay, some, one time a student asked, uh, how important is the essay? And my response was, well, it's either all or nothing. And the reason I say that is because most of the time, 
they're 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 pretty good. Uh, and and it's just you know we're, we're not going to make a decision on a candidate because they wrote a good essay, but we have made decisions on candidates because they wrote a bad essay. And I had a young man this year who wrote an essay that was about three sentences. And I wrote him and said, when you finish your essay, let me know. And he wrote back and said, uh, oh, my essay's finished. What are you talking about? And I felt at that point, I didn't need to explain to him that his three sentences were insufficient. And we never invited him for an interview and he was not offered a seat. All right, looks like we had a question come in um, from a, an attendee who wishes to remain anonymous um, for Mr. Robertson. Of the 133 acceptances and the 800 plus applicants, how many were actual denials? I'm going to say about uh, 350 maybe. Um, if we don't get, if we never invite you for an interview, then you receive a rejection letter at that point. So probably almost half, 350 to 400 were rejected. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All righty, well, if not, um, the contact information for all of our guest facilitators is up on the screen. Please feel free to reach out to them, contact them um, whenever you'd like with any follow-up questions. And I'm sure not only Ms. Robertson, but both of our student ambassadors would be happy to assist you. So this brings us to the end of our session. I know we have covered a lot of information today and I hope this webinar has been of assistance as you start on your optometric journey. Our next webinar will not be a webinar. We'll actually be participating in the optometry virtual meeting held on June 8th. It will be a chance for students to chat with not only us, but representatives from many optometry schools. Schools. It is a great event for those looking to connect with admissions counselors from across the country. To register, please visit the webinar page on our website or look out for our emails. If you haven't done so already, I invite you to request more information by signing up for our inquiry form. You will receive a personal advisor and a personal brochure with information relevant to your goals and experiences. Thank you to our student ambassadors for sharing their time and experiences. Thank you for Mr. Robertson for all of his great insight. And thank you to all of our attendees who have joined us. We have hoped to see you at our next webinar, but in the meantime, have a great rest of your week and weekend and take care.